Our New Testament reading for this morning is Romans 12, 1 to 2. Hear the word of the Lord. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I think that all of us <clears throat> at one time or another really have, have reached a point where we, we desire to know the future. It, it seems like it's a part of who we are. We, we get into a particular situation and we, we want to know the future. We want to know uh, what we should do, uh, where we should go, what God's plan is for us. It's at every stage of our lives. I, I remember back, uh, back in the Middle Ages when I was a seminary student, and um, you know, I, I wondered, how am I going to get all this academic work done, and, and as well as doing my job, and how am I going to pay for the next semester, find a place to live? Was the girl that I was going with, will she be my wife? Uh, would I get a church after I graduated? And I think that m many of you are perhaps in a similar circumstance, a life stage, where you're really concerned about the future, maybe family issues, maybe job considerations, or, or health concerns that you have. What does the future hold for me? I think that it's, it's a factor of our creatureliness, and it's a reality for all of us to want to know the future. Now, some people are so obsessed with it that they try to determine their future decisions by horoscopes and palm readers and psychics. I, I wrote a, a little known book and a littler read book, actually, uh, back in the early 1990s on the New Age movement. I lived in a, the town of Northampton, Massachusetts, which was very New Agey. And um, as part of my research, I did a study on the way psychics went about their, their trade and why they were so popular. <clears throat> And I discovered that they used a certain technique called the Barnum Effect, named after P.T. Barnum, the, the circus showman. And um, it's a phenomenon, he discovered, of human nature that we, um, we tend to respond to stock, generalized statements about us more than we do to accurate profiles of us. It's sort of like the Chinese fortune cookie effect. Let me give you an example. I actually um, listened to some psychics do their reading, and, um, and here's a couple of phrases that I lifted from their readings that they said to people. You are under a great stress and are thinking of a big change in your job or in a close relationship. Pretty generalized, I'd say. But some people who are really eager to know the future go, yeah, that's me. Here's another one. At times you have serious doubts as to whether you've made the right decision or done the right thing. <laughs> Unbelievable. But if you are in that place in your life and you hear something like that, you think it's like, wow, guidance. Here's one last one. You have a great deal of unused capacity which have, you have not turned to your advantage. Of course I do. My boss doesn't even recognize that. This is me. Well, since we want to know the future, but we really don't want to hear the truth, really, we open ourselves up to deception. Now, as Christians, we believe that our past, our present, and our future really not ruled by the stars, nor are they determined by people who have powers. But the future is, is the exclusive domain of the eternal God 
who created us as well as time and space. And therefore, our times are in his hands. Jeremiah 10, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, for it is not for a man to direct his steps. And then Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good, not for harm, plans to give you a future and a hope. All right, let's get back to the issue of guidance now. The question remains that if God, in fact, is in charge and is in control of our future, how do we know what he has in store for us and how do we ascertain that plan for our lives? Now, some Christians try to discern God's will on the basis of how they feel. Hannah Whitehall Smith was a Quaker and she instructed many Quakers against an unbalanced reliance upon their feelings. She told the story of a woman who, <clears throat> who having committed her day in bed in the morning, uh, committed her day to God, she would ask him whether she was to get out of bed or not and wait for he, her, him to say something to her. And then she would, not, she, she would put on each article of clothing. Before she would do that, she would ask the Lord whether she should put it on. Now, how can we, if we were in that kind of a situation, how can we tell the voice of God from our own dysfunctional desires? How can we discern the difference between the Holy Spirit and a hunch? Feelings. But there are some Christians who use fleeces. Remember the story of Gideon in Judges 6? He put out a lamb's fleece, asked that if God wanted him to attack the Midianites the next day, the fleece would be wet and the, dry, the ground dry, and then just, and it was, and then the next day, just to check his answer, he asked for the opposite, and God did it. Don't we look for signs and events? Don't we hang out fleeces sometimes? Is that wrong? But how far do we go with this? And, 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 and is it faith or is it presumption? The passages which you heard in Proverbs have been very helpful for me. And here are a few. Proverbs 16, 3. Commit your way to the Lord and your plans will be established. Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Therefore, I have come to realize that discerning the will of God is really not accessing a a mystical body of future knowledge by means of feelings of fleeces or even freaking out in prayer when you need to make a decision. But it's a matter of trusting in a sovereign and good Heavenly Father who has a plan for us and that we have a part to play not only in planning the future but in ascertaining His guidance and His direction for those plans. Now, how do we do this? It's very practical. I'm gonna give you an outline. This outline is not mine. It comes from the Alpha Bible Study series. And I've taught uh, this outline many times. Now, the content of the outline is mine, but the outline itself, the points, belong to Alpha. So, first one. First point on the outline, how? do we determine or discern the will of God? First, commanding scripture. These all start with C, by the way. Commanding scripture. Psalm 119 is filled with the emphasis that God reveals his will through us, to us through the scripture. Your statutes are my delight, they are my counselors. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. 
so on and so on. God's word gives us a whole range of principles and commands that reflect God's will for how we should live. And that is why we need to continue in the word of God on a daily basis so that we understand how God wants us to live and how he wants to direct us. Because he would not guide us in a way that would go against what he's already said. Now, as a, I had a counseling appointment with a, a young man many years ago. And this man, unfortunately, I mean, not unfortunately, that he was a Christian. He claimed to be a Christian, but unfortunately he left his wife for another woman and believed it was God's will because it felt right. Now, how would you counsel him after you finish slapping him upside the head? Well, basically you would say that what God has said about marriage and adultery are not trumped by our feelings or even by our changing culture. This is what God's word says, regardless of how we feel. Commanding scripture. Second, compelling spirit. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as our comforter and also our guide. In Acts chapter 22, the Apostle Paul describes being overcome by the Spirit while he was praying in the temple in Jerusalem, indicating that he should get out of town because he was not going to find a hearing for the message. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and his companions were uh, about ready to go on a mission to a certain territory, it says, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. In Acts 13, the church of Antioch was at prayer, and the Holy Spirit said to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, we're not told how the Spirit indicated his guidance, whether it was verbal, whether it was through a thought, a prompting, through a scripture, but there was some way that the Spirit of God communicated his will in, this, in these contexts. Now, in my own life, I know that the scripture is a template for all guidance that takes place. But the Spirit often has guided me through circumstances, through my thoughts, through inner promptings, to do something, to speak to someone in a way that's consistent with his word. A few years ago, I was speaking uh, to a church at a church in, in Nashua, New Hampshire. I'm from the New England area and my daughter lived out there. And, and so I was speaking and then I, um, uh, after church was over and, and, and all of that, um, I was driving through Nashua to go back to Brattleboro, Vermont, <clears throat> and I realized the Patriots, which happens to be my favorite football team, uh, were playing the Buffalo Bills, and so I thought I'd stop at a Dunkin' Donuts that had a TV, have a cup of coffee, and watch the game. Well, I went to the Dunkin' Donuts, and, and the game wasn't on, so I looked across the parking lot, and there was a, there was a, a, a bar and grill and I was a little hungry, so I went there, sat, the only place open was at the bar. I sat there, ordered a, a Coke and, and a, a sandwiches, and the game was there. Bills, Patriots playing, and I was intrigued. I was eating my sandwich. And there were a number of guys at the bar, and there was one guy sitting near me, and I noticed him, and he was reading and, and watching the game, reading, watching the game. And I looked at the book, which I often do when I sit next to people on an airplane, like I will be doing in just a, about an hour, flying out of Midway. Um, I always take a peek at what they're reading because it kind of gives you a little idea of the conversation that maybe you can have. And he was reading the Bible. And I noticed he was reading the book of Leviticus. Interesting. So, so I'm thinking, what should I do? And all of a sudden, and, and I believe that I'm not this smart. I, I really believe that the Holy Spirit led me to say this, and it'll sound familiar. I, I leaned over to him and I said, hey, 
do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> and he goes, no. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, I, l l do you mind if I, and as I flipped over to the Gospel of John, and I said, you know, this might be a better place to start, because he admitted he had never read the Bible before. And his name was Matty, and he said he was, he was uh, um, from Florida, he was visiting family, he was waiting for his bus, take a, a bus ride back. He had just, because he had time to kill, he went to this church, it was kind of a new church. He was from a Catholic background, never had been experienced this kind of church before. They gave him a Bible, and that's why he was reading it. And, and so, so I said, the Gospel of John is about Jesus. You've heard of Jesus, of course, I grew up Catholic, he said. Well, and I talked, I basically shared the Gospel with him. And he was really intrigued, and he listened to me very carefully. You know, he didn't even watch the game. Neither did I, which is an amazing thing. <laughs> and and, um, uh, and so, so um, after I finished sharing, I said, Matty, would, is there any reason why you would not want to invite Jesus Christ into your heart right now? He said, uh, I don't know. I, I feel a little uncomfortable about that. I said, he said, uh, let me just keep reading. I go, terrific. And we went back and watched the game. Now, I think that was part of the compelling spirit, guiding, directing, I think even to the location where I watched that game and even sitting at the bar next to this guy who was reading the book of Leviticus. Guy from Chicago, guy from Florida, meeting over a Patriots bill game and talking about the gospel. The compelling spirit. The third point of the outline is common sense. God often guides us through common sense. In 2 Timothy 2.7, Paul gives Timothy some instruction in how to pastor his flock. He says, reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all these things. In Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, it says, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than this. And just a few verses later in that same chapter, it says, but Paul thought it best not to take Mark with them on the second missionary journey. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul says, it seems advisable that I should go to Jerusalem. So, so God gives us minds to use, not to set aside he gives us minds that are renewed by his truth so that when we face certain choices, we should not shy away from making the use of that reasonable mind that God has given to us. To realize that many of our decisions will be very rational and well thought out. Our education, our experience, our culture often form the grid through which God guides us. Common sense, don't set that aside when you are trying to discern the will of God. Fourth point, counsel of saints. Proverbs 15, 22, plans fail for the lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Proverbs 20, verse 18, make plans by seeking advice. God has used the wisdom of other people's experience in my life to whom I've gone for counsel. They didn't always say what I wanted them to say, but they invariably brought out perspectives that I had never thought of. I remember when I was a young single guy, I was complaining to an older brother in Christ how I could not find the right woman for me. He simply asked me if I'd ever considered whether I would be the right man for any woman. Not what I wanted to hear, but really important. By the way, I think it brings up the point that we need mentors in our lives, people that we give permission to, to say, to speak into our lives, someone a little older, a little bit more experience, who cares about us, and who can say things to us that maybe nobody else can. We need to give them permission to do that. Don't go it alone, because God uses other people to guide us. 
The fifth and final point on the outline is circumstantial situations or signs. Proverbs 16, 9 from our text. A man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Very often, he does this by means of circumstances, things that are out of our control, things that, we, that happen to us. We wonder if we should take such and such a job, but then we don't get hired. Hmm. Or whether we should go to a particular school, but then we don't get accepted. What do we do, grouse, complain? Or do we see this as a God's sovereign hand guiding us and, and leading us through these circumstances? One of the most powerful examples of God's control over circumstances came from an article that I, I read recently from the Voice of the Martyrs magazine. And the article um, told of the story of an Algerian jihadist who was hiding uh, from his own government uh, within his own country by staying inside his parents' home and out of uh, public view. What he hated most about being in his parents' home that he had to live with his brother who was a Christian. Well, one day he just had to get away. He had to get out of the house, so he jumped on a bus and just went to a random bus stop, got out, and he saw a woman at the bus stop who was very attractive. And so he asked her if they could get together and talk. And she said, no, I'm a Christian. Oh, he said, suddenly happy for the fact, my brother is a Christian. She had said that, that, that she became a follower of Jesus by listening to Christian radio. And then she said, do you think your brother could get me a Bible? Wanting to both impress her and meet with her again, he said, sure. And so he got a Bible from his brother, and before their appointed time, he began to read it. And one night, he had a dream and saw someone he believed to be Jesus who came to him and said, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give them rest. He confessed Christ as his savior, gave the woman the Bible. They got married. They're now church planters in Algeria. Circumstantial signs, counsel of saints, common sense, compelling spirit, commanding scripture all ways by which God can lead us and guide us. Final point, and I keep this separate because it's really the foundation upon which all these other things I've mentioned rest. And that is that God's guidance is relationally appropriated and not gained by certain techniques. When we are in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and walking in that relationship, God will guide us. He says so in our text. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in his sight, which is your reasonable service, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you might know what is the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. A little girl went out to play. And as she was heading out the door, her mom said, now honey, stay around the house because it's almost supper time and I'll call you when things are ready. Okay, mom. She went outside and saw a little friend next door. She went next door. They saw another friend next door. They went next door, and pretty soon, they were down the end of the street. And she thought it was kind of funny that it was getting dark, and a lot of her friends had already gone in, that she hadn't heard her mom call. So she went back home, walked in. The had, family had finished eating, and mom sent her to a room without supper. And she thought that was terribly unfair. Mom came up, 
And she said, why did you do that? I didn't hear you call. She said, honey, I'm not disciplining you because you didn't hear me call. I'm disciplining you because you didn't stay around the house. You see, ultimately, the will of God has more to do with staying around the house in our relationship to Christ, of being in that relationship, being in proximity, being in the Word, where we hear Him when He calls. That's the key. So often, we're out kind of doing our own thing, running all around, playing in the neighborhood way away from Christ, and all of a sudden something comes to us and we got to know the future by 6 o'clock. And we wonder why God is so slow. It's because we're not around the house. If we are, the promise is that when we submit ourselves to him, when we surrender ourselves to him, when our minds are being renewed daily in his word, that we will know the good, the perfect, the acceptable will of God. And so, here am I, Lord, I surrender myself to you. I desire to know you today. I desire to have my mind renewed by your word. I want my thoughts to be established around that which you desire from me. Would you help me? That's our daily prayer. Not just, God, a genie in the bottle, I need an answer. But God who is the focus and center of our life and that when we are listening to him on a daily basis, we are in proximity to hear his voice when we need to know what to do. Let's just take a moment, quietness and silence, and perhaps this is a time when you can surrender yourself to him. Perhaps confess those patterns, uh, thoughts, behavior that have taken you away from the house in your relationship to Christ, and time to recommit yourself to God and his word so you can hear him when he calls. Let's spend some time in quietness and prayer. Thank you for hearing our prayers, O Lord. And thank you for being God that is so responsive. Might we be responsive to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.